Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts Channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Before we get to today's episode, just a reminder that the first episode of our new show, Lord and Arts Undercovered, will release this Wednesday. A collaboration between one of the best research websites I've ever seen and myself will bring you into the details on cases like never before. Please check out Lord and Arts Undercovered episode one this Wednesday. On to today's show. Case Cracked is where we look into a mystery. And what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's episode is called Forced Confession. Working as a sex worker is a high-risk occupation. Some women who hit the streets are never seen or heard from again. Some try to take precautions, traveling to meeting spots in groups. Some will even write down the license plate and name of their Johns, so that if anything happens, police will be able to track them. But no matter how many precautions they take, this occupation is a daily exercise in risking your life. A lot of women get lost in this intersection of sex, drugs, and money. Around 7 a.m. on August 20th, 2010, a woman walking her dog came across a disturbing sight. In a gravel parking lot on Alice Street in Vanier, Ottawa, Canada, was the body of a woman. She laid in a pool of blood covered in wounds. When the police arrived, they at first thought the woman had been stabbed to death, but her autopsy would show that it was a much more brutal attack. An axe was used. She suffered 28 injuries in all. When a positive identification was made, they discovered they had the body of 36-year-old Jennifer Stewart, a known local streetwalker. At the time of her death, she weighed only 80 pounds. Her toxicology results showed both cocaine and marijuana in her system. From the condition of her lungs, it was ruled that the cocaine was probably crack cocaine, and she had smoked it for quite some time. Her time of death was estimated to be from 6 to 12 hours prior to the discovery of her body. Investigators decided to hide the fact that the killing was committed with an axe from the public, in hopes that when a suspect was developed, that person would mention the correct murder weapon. Jennifer Lee Stewart had worked the streets of Vanier for 20 years, at first, her family saw her working only a few times a week, but she soon started to work every day and frequently well into the night. Jennifer was a mother of four children that she had lost custody of. She went from being a vibrant woman to only answering her door by peering through a small crack. The month before her death, her aunt, Nicole Chenier, and cousin, Melanie Beaupre, had confronted Jennifer about her crack cocaine addiction and offered to help her with getting her off the streets permanently. She refused, saying that she wasn't addicted to crack, and then she left. The day after her murder, investigators began canvassing the area that Jennifer worked in the hope that someone had saw her or her killer the night before. Her crack dealer was found, and he stated that she had bought a pack of rocks at about 11.30 p.m. the night she died. He said, she seemed her normal self, and the dealer didn't feel anything was wrong. Her murder would have happened soon after that interaction. The dealer, however, was cleared as a suspect. Jennifer's boyfriend was due to return from work late that night and came home to not only the fact that his girlfriend was dead, and he was about to be questioned by the police about her murder, but the management also locked him out of their apartment. The housing was meant for people with native status, and the apartment was in Jennifer's name. Her boyfriend had to find somewhere else to live, and after his interview with police, he was cleared as a suspect in her murder. As they waited and grieved, Jennifer's family erected a small cross which was surrounded by flowers in the parking lot where she had lost her life. Her case would see no significant movement for three years. On February 15, 2013, officers at the Ottawa Carleton Detention Center were conducting a routine check of cells when they came to the solitary confinement cell of one Adrian Dow. Dow had been in the cell for 22 days and had proven to be a problematic prisoner. He called himself an aspiring rapper, but was in jail for possession for the purpose of trafficking, basically moving an amount of narcotics in a quantity that wasn't likely for personal use, and also failing to appear in court. He had been sentenced to nine months in jail. Dow suffered from schizophrenia, 
and had been forced to wear a straight jacket in his cell after telling officers that he was possessed by a demon and wanted to eat his own flesh. He stated that if he could cut off his own fingers, the demon would be released. On the guards' rounds that day, Dow stated that he would confess to a murder he had committed if he was taken out of solitary confinement and given a larger cell so he could move around. He also questioned officers about the reward being offered. Could he get the reward for a confession, he asked. Investigators then took him out of his cell to an interrogation room where he was given pizza and coffee. In his interview, Dow confessed to becoming angry when he had learned that he would be spending time in jail on his drug charge. That's when he decided to take out his anger by killing someone. He stated that he lured Jennifer, who was an acquaintance, into the parking lot on Alice Street on the pretense of selling her drugs. When her back was turned, he said he pulled out a military knife and stabbed her to death. Detective John Manette, who was handling the investigation, knew that that wasn't the right murder weapon and told Dow, right now, I'm not convinced that you're telling me the truth. When it was explained that Dow's move wouldn't happen overnight, he was told he would have to provide more details to his confession, details that could be checked. The confession he gave the next morning provided what was needed. The beginning stayed the same, but his motive was different. Now, he claimed that he killed Jennifer in order to become a better rapper. Quote, I had this idea, if I killed somebody, I'd be a really good rapper. People talk about that killer stuff, said Dow. He said the killing made him feel powerful and alive. A month before the murder, he had bought gloves, protective glasses, and a dust mask to protect himself from blood spatter. A receipt for Canadian Tire was found that showed two months before the murder those items, along with an axe, were purchased. Unfortunately, there was no CCTV footage of the purchase. But there was still problems with the story. When he attacked Jennifer, he claimed that she stood with her hands at her sides and didn't try to protect herself. Her autopsy showed that she had tried to defend herself. After committing the murder, he said he jumped several backyard fences before reaching the house he shared with his father and brother, which was just a couple blocks away. He then put his clothes, the axe, and other items in a garbage bag that was disposed of by a friend. He gave the name of the friend, and police called to verify this part of his confession, but were unable to reach the man. They left only a voicemail and never followed up. None of the items, including the murder weapon, were ever found. Jennifer herself was checked for DNA, but what was found came back to another male and didn't match Dow. Finally, to help calm his nerves, Dow claims he walked outside and started smoking a joint on a nearby bike path. Suddenly, Jennifer's ghost flew by him in the dark. He stated that she still visits him a few times a day. Those visits are what prompted his confession. To make matters worse, when Dow had not been moved to a larger cell nine days after his confession, he claimed to have killed another woman in the area. Problem is, this case had been recently solved. Without any strong physical evidence in Jennifer's case to prove his guilt, Dow's case soon went to trial. His trial was short, but the jury deliberated for three days before they reached a decision in December of 2015. Dow was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. At the end of the trial, Dow was asked if he wanted to make a statement for the court or the victim's family, to which he simply replied, no. Her family, however, had a lot to say. Their victim impact statement was read by Detective Manette. In it, they wrote that their precious daughter had met her end in the most violent way possible, and nobody deserves to die like that. Thankfully, the guilty verdict brought some justice for Jen, they said. Her cousin stated, no matter her lifestyle, she was somebody, and she didn't deserve to die like this. We love and miss you, Jen. Case Cracked. I would like to thank the OttawaCitizen.com, APTN News, CBC, OttawaSun.com, and the NationalPost.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. Christy, this story leaves me with a really 
strange feeling. Like I feel mm-hmm. really unresolved about this one. Now, uh, in the notes you sent over, you also mentioned this was part of a wave of attacks on sex workers. Unfortunately, yeah. There were a group of killings of sex workers between 2008 and 2011 that police were desperate to solve. Now, most of these cases already had suspects that had been charged. So we're not talking about a serial killer here. Okay. It's okay. just acts on these sex workers. It's terrible. Yeah. Uh, what it does open up the possibility, like I'm just thinking if Dow isn't the guy, mm-hmm. like could it be that maybe this was a second killing for one of these other guys that was tried in one of these other cases? Like if, if you be. have, yeah, if you have a spike in crime like this in this particular area, um, and especially because of these conditions, I'm really hung up on, I mean, we've got this guy who has a confession that doesn't initially match the weapon used. Mm-hmm. He's got a motive changing from one day to the next. And by the way, he's being biased this whole time by wanting to get out of solitary confinement. Yes. And uh, it's coming from someone who has schizophrenia, is literally talking to ghosts on a daily basis, mm-hmm. confessed to another murder that they know he didn't do. Like, I mean, if you're just looking at this person just kind of as a character, as I mean, there is there is so much to be questionable about this. Like, I would really hope that the investigators would ratchet this down. And honestly, I feel like this shouldn't have gone past that first day. Like, as soon as he said it was a knife, they should have just been like this. I mean, that was their big test. So yeah. it's, it's really, really weird. Uh, I feel the same way. And I mean, not only that. But the receipt from Canadian Tire that they used at trial, it shows he purchased items that were likely used in the attack, including the axe. Right. But, I mean, there's a problem with this, too. This wasn't a receipt that was found or brought to them by Dow. Okay. He did say he bought the items like that from Canadian Tire. Yeah. And the police asked the store to review their records, but they found a purchase matching it, but it was two months before the attack happened. Now, Dow says that he bought those items a few days to two weeks before. So, yeah, that's, and then that's something else. Even with his motivation, this isn't like lining up. Like, he's he mm-hmm. says he's mad. Well, initially, he says he's mad because he's going to have to go spend time in prison. Mm-hmm. So, he thought about this two months before, bought weapons, waited and then used them. Like, none of that is, is really making sense. No. Uh, the rapper thing. I, I mean, that it literally just sounds like he's just trying to get something to stick with them, like mm-hmm. for him using motives, because that, uh, yeah, that really doesn't make much sense to me at all. No. Um, however, you know, yes, we, we have a receipt. Maybe the time frames don't match up. If they actually tie it to him, like, you know, if he used a credit card or something like that, I understand now. Now we're in business. Now we're talking. Is that what happened here? No, <laughs> no. The purchase was cash. And since two months had passed between that time and the attack, they didn't, you know, they didn't have any CCTV footage to back anything up. No video. Yeah. No. So it just, it really feels like this thing's being put together in a real haphazard way. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, it would have really helped if we found the ax in this situation, but no luck there because of this brilliant move of getting it rid, getting rid of it. He had a friend throw it in the trash. What's the story on this? See, even that changes. The friend was actually his father. Okay. He says initially that he got rid of the ax. The next time he talks to police, he says that his, he gave it to his father who dismantled the ax and got rid of it in the garbage. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. Like I'm just looking for some other aspect to corroborate all this information. Yeah. So you're not going to find it. They, they interview the father. They bring him to trial. They called him and left him a voicemail. <clears throat> that was it. They didn't, he didn't call back. They didn't try again to get a hold of him. Nothing. So this went to trial without the father's insight. And he was the one who got rid of the murder weapon, supposedly. It feels like an investigation that really doesn't want to prove itself wrong. It feels like a house of cards. Like mm-hmm. you've got it just perfect and you're just not going to risk looking at the reality of it. That's, I mean, that's mm-hmm. really bizarre. It just really, this, this whole investigation doesn't seem complete. No, it, and it didn't seem that way to the appeals court either. This won't surprise you. The lead detective was allowed by the trial judge during the trial to give his non-expert opinion to the jury about the validity of the bizarre confession. Yeah. In June of 2021, the Ottawa Court of Appeals set aside 
the 2015 conviction and ordered a whole new trial for Dow. And we're still waiting on that. Oh, wow. So this thing is really, it's, it's raveling apart. There's a really yes. good chance. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a new story that comes out that they're dropping the prosecution, they're releasing him and, and that's it. It wouldn't um, surprise me either. Cause these, these pieces that we're talking about, like I, how do you get around reasonable doubt with these giant holes? I don't know how they got a conviction the first time. He must have had a terrible legal de defense team like mm -hmm. this. I don't These are holes big enough to drive a truck through. Like, this is amazing. Oh, yes. um, and what's really terrible about all that, it, there's, there's two sides that are terrible. Number one, you know that the family is looking for justice. They've mm -hmm. now been given some form of justice. And they're, it's, they're not in a spot where they're going to be able to determine is this accurate or not? Is this right or is this wrong? They're just seeing their, you know, our investigators telling us this is the guy. We've got a conviction. That means this is the guy. And they're processing that emotionally that way. Mm -hmm. Now, that is being unraveled. And the possibility that this isn't the guy is really becoming a potential reality that they have to deal with. If you accept that, the real person has been free this whole time and is still mm -hmm. out there. Really and who terrible. knows if they've murdered again. You have the mistreatment of a of a disabled man. Right. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. just taking him at his word and all oh, this was just it was terribly done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh Christy, thank you so much. This is this is one I'm certainly gonna be thinking about for a couple of days here. And uh mm -hmm. I'll be looking forward to any news alert updates that we get on this. Oh yes. Um and I'm calling this one case uncracked at this point because this <laughs> this thing really, or cracked to the point that it fell apart. Like this is <laughs> that's this is true. That's yeah. Case broken. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, PayPal supporters Jennifer Wilson and Larissa Mertschank. For over six years, we've always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube, and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help the channel keep going and growing, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Carolyn Schmidt recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode's coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below if you want to catch one of our weekly secret studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.